Good afternoon everyone and welcome to our panel interview on minimally invasive dentistry using CEREC and laser technology. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank our panel members for joining us today. Dr. Monique Vassant has many years experience in restorative dentistry, specialising in minimally invasive aesthetic dentistry at his practice Fresh Dental, located in Greater Manchester and London. Monique lectures around the world on minimally invasive techniques and also composite bonding. Dr. Cohen Rajan has a special interest in smile design and expertise in same-day smile makeover treatment. Cohen is trained in the USA and gained Associate Fellowship of the World Clinical Laser Institute and is a member of the BACD. He gained a fellowship in laser dentistry from the University of Genoa in 2015. So gentlemen, the topic is minimally invasive dentistry using CEREC and laser technology. Uh, Monica, I'd like to ask you the first question if I may. So, sure. Why would you choose a composite block over a ceramic for some of your minimally invasive techniques? So ultimately we've just got to look at the global picture of the, of the patient's teeth. Um, there's no right solution in terms of which material to use in every case, but what I would say is when I would choose a composite block over ceramic would, would, would be when I've maybe got uh, existing composite direct restorations that I'm about to do, and I've got one indirect restoration, or one or two indirect restorations. Just for symmetry, I think, in terms of long-term wear, long-term optical properties, we're going to gain more by sticking with the same material. Um, so I would rather use a material like composite um, and ideally uh, a composite block that also has a matching uh, restorative material with it. Um, just so you can stay with the overall uh, same material and the aesthetics and the wear will be the same throughout. Um, also in the back of the mouth maybe I'd choose a situation where I don't want to overload um, a tooth or where I want something that's very kind to the opposing tooth so a composite block would be good there. Um, yeah, there's, there's times when I choose composite, times when I choose ceramic, but definitely I think the fact that we've got composite blocks just means that it opens up a whole new uh, game for us. You're clearly very experienced with uh, composite technology and adhesions, so do some of your adhesive techniques influence your choice of composite blocks, or is it mainly for the reasons you said, and what about things like repairability as well? So I think um, the aesthetic outcome guides it, because nowadays with anything we can pretty much bond it. Uh, provided we've got good bonding protocols, good clinical practice techniques, um, I'm not too worried about the longevity of the, uh, of, of the various materials because there's lots of good materials out there. What I'm looking at more is um, the aesthetic outcome. So the material that's going to give me the best aesthetic outcome in relation to whatever else is around it mm -hmm. is probably going to guide my decision making process. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Uh, so Cohen, just a question to yourself um, on the use of lasers. What are the everyday uses for water lays in, the terms, in terms of minimally invasive dentistry in your practice? Uh, well, I find water lays to be a very um, a, a tool that I can use for soft and hard tissue. Uh, and I find it very versatile. Uh, we use it quite a lot for exposing, um, exposing margins, particularly in the days now of scanning. I've been using CEREC for 15 years. and. Uh, it's very easy to pick up the water lays and just use it to expose margins without causing any trauma to the patient specifically because the water lays ablation process doesn't traumatize the tissue. So that's primarily what I'm using it for. Uh, in terms of minimally invasive, I think that is pres preserving soft tissues equally as minimally invasive as, um, as preserving tooth tissue. Uh, and in terms of CEREC treatment, um, I think that actually doing a treatment in one visit reducing the number of shocks to the, to the pulp um, is definitely a plus for digital dentistry and is definitely minimally invasive, much less, more, uh, much less trauma to the pulp. We've talked uh, a lot today in the lectures about cost efficiency, mm. time efficiency, mm. of course, and revenue streams. Mm. So a question to both of you. Um, how can the use of water lays and CEREC uh, save teeth preparation uh, and also time and money? I think it's probably more fun. Okay, that's fine. Right. Uh, so, uh, well, I, as I said, um, I think once uh, the water lays is integrated into the practice, uh, the, the training that I've had and for me and my team from Henry Shine have been very good. Uh, it's been enabled me to just wheel it out as and when I need it. I use it uh, pretty much every day. Uh, with, in terms of the 
combination of the two, they work very well together. Uh, a, for, actually from a marketing perspective, uh, it, uh, patients do appreciate um, the investment that we've made into the practice uh, to provide better care for them. Uh, particularly in an increasingly crowded uh, market that we both work in, um, anything to help us stand out, I think, uh, helps. Uh, in terms of, uh, so uh, cost-wise, that I think that's definitely pay for itself after a while. Uh, in terms of combination of water laser and CIREC, uh, when I do anterior cases, uh, with the water laser specifically, uh, moving up gingival margins, uh, move it doing, uh, doing crown lengthening in the anterior section, uh, means because of the way that the water laser works, it doesn't traumatize the tissue uh, and you don't have any post-operative inflammation. Uh, and as a result, you don't have any scarring and no shrinkage. So the, the gum levels that we create are very stable and that in combination with CIREC makes me able to do the same day smile makeovers with a lot of confidence. Uh, Monik, just moving back to yourself on choice of materials, um, the modification of composite blocks uh, and also uh, bonding and cementation, could you expand on your preferred techniques with regard to that? Yeah, I think the, the key thing is with any sort of composite block is that um, we just want to air a break. So we have 27, 50 micron aluminium oxide an aero uh, and then we use some sort of primer, so I know, my preference is either the one coat seven universal, we just paint this on a fitting surface, and then go and uh, bond with whatever bonding system you want. Um, in terms of customization, this is one of the beauties of composite. We can change the shape, you know, once it's on, we can stain and glaze as much as we want to without having to put it in a furnace. So it gives us the option, just as a normal direct composite would do, we can completely modify it so we can customize something if you want to and really make it very personal to the patient or we can uh, very quickly restore something and keep it uh, you know, fairly basic in terms of restoration if we want to but that doesn't seem any harm because these are just surface coatings so you know we don't do any harm by doing it. Thank you. Oh, in terms of bonding sorry, um, in terms of bonding uh, again just standard bonding protocol, good isolation um, which is probably the most important thing with yeah, resin yes, cement, agree. we'll deal with it. Mm -hmm. But if we've got good isolation, so using rubber dam or isovac or something like this, we will get a decent enough result to keep that restoration on for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we've got moisture contamination, all these sort of things, all the other steps kind of don't matter because it's just going to fail anyway. So Absolutely. I think just concentrating on the basics and then if you've got the option to get really nice bonding agents and really nice uh, cements and things, that's brilliant. But mm. the key thing is moisture control. I think there's often been confusion about uh, what material do we etch, when do we etch, yeah. do we etch composite, do we silanize, what, so, what, what, what do you feel? So we don't etch or, uh, composite in any way, shape or form. All the composite needs is uh, sandblasting and then we put some sort of composite primer in. The one coat seven that I'm using at the moment um, has the ability on the composite blocks to become part of the methacrylate uh, resin matrix but it, it does that in two ways, but it also bonds to the filler particles as well. So we get the bond to the filler and the resin, which means that when we then uh, bond that on, we've got more of a mono sort of block of material um, in there. So there's less room for leakage. Yeah. And certainly I would say in terms of uh, uh, preparation for bonding of ceramics, um, the advantage to digital, uh, digital dentistry, particularly with the CEREC, which I use, um, is that we are in control of what uh, is happening to the ceramic and we are, we are sure of what's going on. So in terms of you know, uh, etching times for ceramic, silenating agents being fresh, and the surface not being contaminated, I think we are in much better stead than something that's sent to us from a laboratory where we don't really know what, how the surface has been treated. And that tends to give us a more reliable bond. Yeah, and, I mean, I, I certainly think that we shouldn't be uh, relying on the technicians mm. to edit things for us anyway. So we, even indirect, we tell the guys just to send it back as you it comes out. To be in control. Yeah, we, you know, I think it's good to be in control of all that. I mean, I don't know whether I've got issues or something, but you know, I, think, <laughs> I, think I think we all have those issues. <laughs> I think, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, but I just think it's better. We, we, we know exactly what's going on. Yeah. But I think with Sarek, that does, you've got ultimate control over your margins. Uh, you can assess your prep before you send it, you know, send it to the lab. You know what's going on, so there's less time. Um, and ultimately, it's not about time and your profitability. It's about the patient putting them through uh, mm -hmm. as little damage and little disruption as possible. And this does that because you spot an error before it's going to go to the lab. Um, you know, you're going to optimize the bonding, you're going to optimize the design, you're going to mm. optimize everything. So I think it's good to be able to offer this. 
and, and not just look at it from a financial point of view, but look at it as though it's actually just raising the game of your dentistry that you're doing. That's good. That's great to get that clarification. Um, just coming back to yourself, uh, we find more and more um, uh, clinicians are looking to move to uh, bringing a laser into the practice. There is some confusion, I think, over, over choice about mm -hmm. what technology to use. Sure. The question, I think, will be, how is the water laser better than electrosurgery um, in terms of minimally invasive approach and so on and technologies and are there big differences between some of the lasers? Sure, I mean um, as I said earlier the, um, the water laser is unique in terms of the uh, choice, well not unique but uh, unique in terms of um, its ability to treat both hard and soft tissue at the same time. The uh, difference between that uh, for example and a diode laser or electrosurgery is that electrosurgery and diode lasers cause uh, trauma and carbonization to the tissue. Um, and the risk of that, uh, and it's not really a risk, it does happen in all cases, is that uh, the tissue then reacts by becoming inflamed, uh, and then the tissue reacts by scarring, and that can make the margins where you're trying to put the soft tissue, especially in the aesthetic uh, or interior region, uh, be, be, make it less predictable and that's where the water lays uh, with its process of ablation which does not cause uh, post-operative inflammation is much better and more, much much more predictable and that's why I think it's much better. So I can't, I can't live without the device? I that's certainly can't live, live with, I'd say I use it every day but uh, I think it's also what, what you get used to you know I mean people pack cords still and then take and then remove it and take scans and it just seems to me you know like last century's um, technology, don't you agree? Uh, you know, I'm probably the wrong person. To talk about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, maybe I better buy a laser. A bit of <laughs> I think my wife's going to kill me. It's going to leave here slightly light pocket. <laughs> I'm sure she'll understand more. Yeah. Um, anything more you'd like to mention about material choice on the because I think so, that's a very popular question for the symposium for those that are, have invested or will invest in technology. Yeah, I mean, there's so many materials out there. I mean, mm. you've got your zirconias, you've got lithium disilicates, you've got these hybrid materials, you've got your composite stuff. I think there's a time and a place for every sort of material. Mm. And you've just got to look at the case. So, for example, if you've got a case where you're worried about the fracture of a tooth, well, you want to make sure that tooth is not going to flex too much. So you need a stiffer material. If you've got a case where maybe you want to um, not have too much force on the tooth. So you want a material that's a bit more forgiving, like maybe an implant crown or a tooth which has had you know, a lot of work done on it. Maybe you want to have something like a composite block. Maybe at the front of the mouth, if you've got a load of ceramic, then you'd rather use another ceramic to replace it. If you've got a load of composite, you might as well use another co a composite to replace it. And I think it's just not looking at, oh, I've got ceramic, I've got these blocks, I'm just gonna use these blocks. I, I agree. think you mm -hmm. should be able to think a little bit, because ultimately, you know, we're, we're, we're clinicians, and you should be able to plan and customize your treatment based upon the case, not make your patient's work fit what you've got in your drawer. So um, I think that's it. I mean, there's, there's, there's loads of nice materials. Um, none of the materials that are out there at the moment are, are terrible. There's lots of good points. But um, it's just using the right one at the right time. I agree, so, yeah. Monique Cohen, I think that was a great um, insight into minim minimally invasive techniques using laser, using CEREC, and I know it's a, a treatment path that a lot of clinicians look to do, uh, particularly mini minimally invasive dentistry. So thank you for your time this afternoon on Pleasure. the panel. Much appreciated. Thank you. Pleasure.